Hi, Eric Bailey, along with Eli Letterman for this week's edition of Oklahoma Football Podcast. <laughs> We're talking everything OU football. Game week is finally here. After nine months of hearing Brent Venables talk about the new job and taking over uh, September 3rd, Saturday, they'll face the UTEP Miners in the season opener. Uh, Eli, this is we've waited for this. It's finally here. Uh, you can feel the excitement being around the players and coaches this week. I did the math yesterday. Brent Venable stepped to the podium for his game week press conference exactly 267 days <laughs> after his introductory press conference back in December. So it has been a while, and you can tell the anticipation with Brent. You can certainly feel it with the fan base. Even talking to the players yesterday, it's funny. Some of them think this was the fastest offseason ever because there was just so much change, so much going on. And others, maybe where more of the fan base lies is, felt like the longest ever because there was just so much that went on and, and so much that did get introduced. But finally, we're here and we're going to get to talk about something other than the program that's getting built. And it's going to be the, the talk goes out the door now and we get football. And that's what this is all about. So I'm pretty stoked for Saturday. You know, to a man, everyone seemed like they're just excited about playing someone in a different colored uniform. You know, they've been going with each other all during fall camp, but it's like this every year. Everyone's looking forward to that first game. The anticipation is a little higher this year with Brent Venables being his first season. We're going to see a new look defense. Dylan Gabriel is going to make his debut. Uh, so there, there's a lot of intrigue going into this first game. Uh, UTEP, of course, played last Saturday, had a rough outing against North Texas with a home loss, but uh, it doesn't seem like any of the players or coaches are taking the minors lightly. No, I mean, it, it, it started with Ted Roof and then Brent Venables yesterday saying essentially that they, they didn't feel like that scoreline really reflected UTEP or, or maybe even that game. They You break it down. There was a, they had a goal line fourth and one where the fumble went over the, a snap went over the quarterback shoulder. They had opportunities, uh, UTEP, to at least make that a closer game. And uh, now do I think they're going to come to Norman and, you know, race the Sooners? We'll see. But I think this is a UTEP team that we do know for for certain is experienced. They've got a fifth year coach in Dana Demel. They've they've brought a lot back from last year. It was their best year in, in close to a decade. And so they're they're not they're at the very least maybe a lot of these schools that are welcoming so called cupcake games in this week uh, might they might be walkovers. They might be teams that are figuring things out. At the very least, UTEP comes with a lot of experience, and it's a group that that kind of knows what it is, and and certainly a lot of respect coming from Brent Venables, from Ted Roof for, for this program. Um, and I, I guess we'll just see what that all looks like on Saturday. You know, while UTEP is the opponent, the focus is going to be on Oklahoma's debut. Uh, you know, there's not there, – there are a ton of storylines going into this game. I mean, we could have wrote stories on all kinds of things. I know, Eli, you have a big feature coming up on Brent Venables, kind of just talking about his road to, to OU. Uh, we, we Justin Harrington has a real unique story, how he's fought his way back onto this roster. I know we're working on a story. You're working on a story about that. I, I had a chance to talk to Dylan Gabriel's mother uh, this week and had a chance to talk to a little bit, get a little bit more insight of what has made him the leader that he is today. So, you know, as writers, as journalists, it's fun trying to, you know, it's really open up these storylines and get a dig a little deeper. And it's been a lot of fun with Harrington though. I, I think that's going to be interesting. You talk about a young man who, Stepped away from the team, worked his way back. Uh, Brent Venables called it humility and, and come back with humility. And, and it really seems like he did. You had a chance to talk to Justin yesterday. Yeah, it was. Uh, so as a note, the number keeps going up for Brent. But he said something. He estimated yesterday that 50 percent of the roster will be playing their first game for the Sooners. So there is a lot of new on Saturday. But I'm not sure within that group or, or with any group on this roster, there's anyone more compelling than Justin Harrington in the sense that this is a guy who uh, this time last year hadn't suited up yet for the Sooners, played four games in September, then entered the portal. This is all back in the Lincoln Riley era. And for all by, you know, for all intents and purposes, seemed like his Norman career was over. And then in the spring, we find out he's coming back and and he's certainly carved out a role for himself this summer. He comes in listed as, as the number two at the Cheetah position behind Deshaun White. But that's just one part of the story. The other part here is, is how he got back. And it started basically once the new staff came in, I mean, he had, he was getting re-recruited by, by Woody Washington and Reggie Grimes and Key Lawrence. He stayed in touch with those guys. He stayed in touch with the new coaching staff. And that all led to this meeting with Brent Venables, where, uh, as you said, you know, Brent talked about humility and expecting nothing. And, and what Justin said was, it was about, he said it was maybe his least prideful moment. It was about setting aside all pride, all that, and really just asking for a second chance. And, and he spoke about this meeting where, 
he and Brent spoke about almost everything but football. They just talked as people and about, you know, decisions you make when you're 22 years old uh, and all that. And, and here he is, not just back as a walk-on. I mean, shoot, speaking of humility, this is a guy who came in. It's a pretty coveted junior college recruit with a scholarship. He's now back and in line to likely play, but he's a walk-on. And, and it really is an, a fascinating story. There will be more to read about it at TulsaWorld.com. Um, but he's a guy, I think, if you wonder who I'm going to be keeping an eye out for, especially on defense on, on Saturday and when he gets into this game, it's Justin Harrington. You speak about humility. I think the Oklahoma football program on the field faced a little humility last year by not making the Big 12 championship game. That's always the goal every year is to, make, to win a Big 12 championship, and it leads to bigger things. Of course, you always want to be in that college football playoff. We're seeing all kinds of things as the season uh, starts, predictions. Everyone's wondering what's going to happen with Oklahoma, what's going to happen under Brent Venables, new quarterback, Dylan Gabriel. How is Jeff Levy going to do? Uh, there's so many question marks nationally. Uh, and, and I see some people, I, I think one of the prominent national writer has OU at seven and five, and that's a crazy prediction. I, I just don't see that. Uh, I think if Eli, I'm going to ask you your prediction in a second of what Oklahoma is going to do this year. I'm going to say 10 and two this season. I, I don't know where the two losses are going to come. Uh, again, I've said this since Brent Venables took over the program. Nothing's seamless. I mean, it's not going to be a seamless transition. There's going to be some growing pains. There's going to be some hiccups. There's going to be some adversity. Uh, I don't know where those two losses will be, but I will say this. I do fully expect OU to be back in the uh, Big 12 championship game, and uh, I, I think they'll be back. Uh, and I'm going to go out on a limb and say their opponent will be Oklahoma State. And it's strange saying that. You would have never, I would have never guessed it in 2017 going into that season that here we are entering the 2022 campaign that OU and OSU have never met in the Big 12 championship game. It's never happened. And OU and OSU have played in every one of those since the 2017 inception, uh, a resumption, I'm sorry, of the Big 12 championship game. But uh, I want to predict, Eli, and I'm asking you your prediction in a second. I'm going to go 10 and 2. Uh, Big 12 title game. I think they're going to be Big 12 champions, but I'll, I'll just say OU, OSU in the title game. Uh, what are your thoughts on Oklahoma's prospects this year? Well, I won't. It won't be too interesting because I'm going to say 10 and 2 as well, because I, I think to your point, we don't know what the horizons are. There's not an easy game. I don't really think in this conference. I think at the very top, when you look at OU, OSU, Baylor, Texas, you know, they could all beat up on each other and everyone might come into that, you know, those last couple weeks of the season with a loss or two. I don't know that we're going to have an undefeated regular season conference champion. And, and OU's got, um, you know, some of those tough games. Fortunately, both of, of OSU and Baylor for them are, are at home. That helps. Um, but those are going to be tough games. You figure some of those tough road trips, you know, maybe a loss pops up there for a, a, a new team and a first-year head coach. But I think 10-2 and two, um, feels like where they'll be, and that should get them to Arlington. But once they get there, I think they're seeing somebody else. I think they're seeing Dave Aranda. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Baylor. Part of me want to say K State, but that one that that's my uh, kind of out out there prediction. We'll, we'll <laughs> stick with Baylor. Uh, I think you know that when you look at the two defenses that carried Oklahoma State and Baylor last year, I was up there in Stillwater. I think the Cowboys have lost more, and I just know how important some of those guys, Malcolm Rodriguez, the guys in the secondary, Devin Harper with Malcolm at linebacker, and so I think Baylor's defense holds on a bit more. And, and we'll see what Blake Shapin does at, at quarterback for Baylor. He got that job in the spring. He might hold the keys to all that. But similar to you, I, I think when Oklahoma gets there, they get to Arlington and they, they bring home that Big 12 title. And we see where, where the chips land from there. But I, I think I, I, like, I like the idea of a Bedlam Big 12 title game, too. I could see uh, that's a whole Oklahoma party in Arlington. <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny, defense win championships. We hear that all the time. And, you know, Oklahoma State and Baylor last year allowed less than 20 points a game, which really was the foundation for both of those runs uh, into New York's New York's bowl, six bowls and, and the success that both those schools had. So defense again at Baylor, it, you know, and OSU, that'll be something to watch. Uh, going into back to the Sooners, we look at offensive uh, MVPs. I, I want you to pick an offensive MVP. I think we're both going to pick one here. And let's play this game without picking Dylan Gabriel. Dylan Gabriel is off the board. We can't pick him as the MVP. Who would, is your prediction as a defensive MVP or offensive MVP, excuse me? Well, you're right. I think if this team gets to where we think they'll be, Dylan Gabriel will be their offensive MVP. So we, we take him out of the conversation. And then it gets pretty interesting because you've got some options in the receiving game. Marvin Mims would come up. You could even look at the offensive line. But for me, knowing what 
the passing game needs and support and the way that Jeff Levy operates his offenses. It's got to be a running back for me. So it's Eric Gray. I think we, we can be pretty confident maybe of what we'll get from Dylan Gabriel. But if Eric Gray can prove to be this lead back that, that Jeff Levy thinks he can be and that the Sooners need him to be, I think that's where this team maybe goes from, a, you know, one ceiling, which is, you know, maybe they can get to Arlington and, and have a shot there to, to elevating it even further and elevating this team is if Eric Gray can be the guy. So he's my prediction for, for offensive MVP. I think if all go, if things go as well as they can go for the Sooners, he'll have a big part in it. You know, Eric Gray, everyone expected big things out of him last year. And of course, everyone remembers what Kennedy Brooks was able to do. You just see that hunger in Eric Gray. He really wants to be the lead back. And I think he can, it's a role he can accept. That's a great pick. I'm going to go out on a limb a little bit. Uh, you know, with Dylan Gabriel spinning the football, we talk about his accuracy, what he can do. Uh, you know, Brent Venables talked this week about how he anticipates very well and can see things uh, and predict things. And Levy said that as well. I'm going to go outside the box and pick Jalil Farouk uh, just because Love I think it. that passing game is going to be so huge. We saw what Farouk could do uh, last year, late last season, the Alamo Bowl, and, and, and we know what kind of player he is, the talent he is. What was it like watching those two work together, Gabriel and Farouk, during the offseason, during seven-on-seven? Seven? I don't know. I just got a gut feeling that, you know, it's been a while since you've had that real game-breaker at wide receiver that you can really look at. And, you know, you see your D.D. Westbrooks, you see your Marquis Browns, Hollywood Browns. You see guys like that. And I think Farouk could be that speedster that could give OU an opportunity to, to, to make some plays in the passing game. And But I, I do think I think Eric Gray is a really good pick, too, because I do think Oklahoma is going to put a much more emphasis on the run game. Yeah, I think, I mean, you're, you're right there because we can maybe, you know, Mar Marvin Mims has proven pretty consistent. And I think we know that he and Dylan Gabriel have forged a connection, the whole thing. But that can't be the only element to this passing game. It's going to take guys behind them. And that's why I like Jalil Farouk is a guy who's who's shown it at times that, you know, this maybe this can be his year. And if it is, again, that that maybe heightens the ceiling because they're going to need production behind Marvin Mims in that in that receiving core. So I, I, I like that pick. Now, if we jump over to the defense, Eric, it's going to be that that might of the two units, maybe the more the one with more questions in a sense, because there's just so many guys and at interesting points in their careers. Who do you think, if, if they're getting to Arlington and, and winning this Big 12 title, is that defensive MVP? You know, the safe pick is David Iguaybu at middle linebacker. I just think because the way he finished his season last year and made plays, I think he can be a guy. We had a chance to talk to him yesterday. He's, he's willing to accept that role, and he's embracing that challenge of being a leader on this defense. I think he's an easy uh, easy one to pick because of his position being a middle linebacker. I'm really looking forward to also seeing a uh, – uh, Reggie Grimes and uh, Ethan Downs. I want to see what the, if you can get that edge rush. What can you get off the ends? And uh, both those guys under Miguel Chavis has, have really had good fall camps. I think Oklahoma is going to need that outside pressure, that outside rush to, to, to make things happen. And all this goes hand in hand with Brent Venable's new defensive scheme. Uh, it's, it's hard to pick a defensive MVP because you just don't know what you're going to see out of this personnel when it meshes with Venable's style. But I, I think Aguebu is the easy choice because of his position. But I really am leaning toward Downs and, and um, Reggie Grimes on the edge to see what they can do. What about yourself? Well, I think, you know, you focused up front. I'm, my mind is jumping kind of to the back of the defense. And, and part of me thinks, you know, Billy Bowman just feels like a guy who we there was a reason he was playing last year as a freshman. He's got the talent. Uh, and now he's, as we've talked about, he's settled into one spot at safety. Um, he should stay there, I think, based on the depth, even if injuries do rack up. And, and to me, he has the, the ability to maybe be the guy that elevates this defense. But the other one I'm interested in, and I know we've, we've talked about the cheetah position to the point that Brent Venables is, is tired of talking about the <laughs> cheetah position, but I, Deshaun White, or really whoever fills that role, but it, week one, it's slated to be Deshaun White. That to me has just even in what the description of the job is, the cheetah is this hybrid linebacker safety, basically a guy who covers the field and is kind of a do-it-all Swiss Army knife. And to me, in a defense that we don't quite know what it's going to look like and where in a new scheme, seems to me that that cheetah position is at the center of it. And so I kind of lean to Sean White as a guy who, who maybe is, is right at the center of everything. Um, so I, I, that's where my mind jumps. But there's a, this, if this is any indication, the fact that we picked all these different guys, there's just so many, there's so much to see on this defense. And we'll get our first look Saturday. I think we got two more questions here before we, uh, yeah. we jump out, Eric. Yeah, let, let's do q and I'm going to ask you a question. You ask me a question. My question to you. Uh, and we took Dylan Gabriel 
off the off the line when we ask about uh, offensive MVP, but can Dylan Gabriel be the Big 12 first team quarterback this season? What do you think? I guess, can I ask it for a clarification from you? And, yeah. and none of this will matter in December when we vote. Are we talking about the best statistical quarterback or is it going to be the quarterback that kind of wins, that, that wins the regular season title? I'm going to I'm gonna say first team Big 12 quarterback that's selected by voters. Is he going to be that kind of guy? Is he going to be that guy? That didn't help me at all, but I'm going to work with this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the, let, let me start over. Okay. Will, I'll just point blank. Yeah. Will he be the first team quarterback voted by media uh, in December? Will he be the guy? It's kind of hard to reckon with the fact that I think this, that the Sooners may win the regular season title, and it'd be hard to imagine that being the case and Dylan Gabriel not being that pick. But I actually might lean towards Spencer Sanders in, in, uh, in Stillwater, because I do think maybe by function, you know, last year that Oklahoma State team was different than a lot of these Gundy era teams. They focused, it, it was the defense that was on the field a lot that they leaned on and the offense, at least kind of breaking some tradition in Stillwater, wasn't asked a ton of it. Um, I think that's going to flip again this year back because I, I think that the OSU defense, even if it is good, and I, I'm excited to see what Derek Mason does up there in year one as a defensive coordinator, they won't be able to lean on it the same way. So they may turn to, to Spencer Sanders. And I know the folks in Stillwater can see that going one of two ways because we've seen what Spencer Sanders looks like. But I do think I think he's going to have a statistical year that that maybe blows the other quarterbacks in the conference mm -hmm. out of the water. And so that's where I guess I go with that pick. But I think it'll be a close second. If things go the way we think with OU, Dylan will be right there. But that's that's my uh, okay. the pick for now. We'll see where that goes. Now for you, this OU defense, that was a point of contention all last year. It's been a point of contention in some ways ever since Brent Venables left, uh, you know, in in after the 2011 season. Do you think this defense, and it, this is what it's all about, Brent Venables comes here, not because he's an offensive coach, because he's a defensive guy. Can they be a top 25 defense this season? Will they be there when we get to December? I think they can be. I really do. I think that, again, I, and I'm going to revert to what I said earlier, nothing is seamless. Nothing's going to be the transition. There's going to be some rough patches, of course. But I really think that the tools are in place for this team to have success. I, you know, you know, I think the cheetah position, I know Brent's tired of talking about it, but that's just something that can really, it's an added element that I'm really impressed to watch. I, I think the experience on the defensive line, when you look at Jalen Redmond and you look at Jeffrey Johnson, uh, who was a 40-plus you know, game starter at Tulane, what he's going to be able to bring to that defensive line, I think that's huge. Uh, and then the secondary, uh, Billy Bowman, I, I think we talked about him a little bit earlier, just playing one position, just staying at strong safety and focusing on that, you know, as a sophomore. I think he, we've seen the talent that he has. I think that he can really make that big jump by having just one responsibility. And I, I, I think the passing game and, and slowing down the passing game is going to be big. The cornerbacks, the onus is going to be on the cornerbacks. Uh, Woody Washington, of course, we know what he can do. And Jaden Davis, uh, you know, Brent told us not to be surprised because of that he was a starter because Brent seen what he did at fall camp. But I think to people that have covered the program and watched this team closely, you know, everyone kind of assumed DJ Graham was going to be the guy opposite Woody, but Jaden Davis has earned that role. So I think that there's a lot of familiarity with these names. I think that they're inspired by playing for under a new system and, and Brent's success at Clemson speaks for itself. I think that that goes a long way. Uh, but it's going to take a little bit of time to get to where Brent wants this defense to be. I think it's going to be a work in progress. I think they're going to improve every week. They're going to fine tune things. Uh, but I do think that they can be a top 25 defense. I really do. And uh, if they do do that, it's going to take them where they want to be in December. I do think on the whole, there, there seems to me to be just enough talent on this defense that if this scheme works and if Brent Venables and Ted Roof can work their magic, and we are talking about a, a, a head coach who was for nearly a decade the top defensive assistant in the country or among them, it's probably him and Dave Aranda, that I think I think it's all there for them. What it looks like, we'll see. Eric, one, one last one. This should, should be an easy one. Who are the first five coaches to get fired this year? <laughs> Thanks. Who's on the hot seat? Yeah. <laughs> no, there'll be plenty of time for that. That's for sure. I mean, uh, you know, uh, poor Scott Frost and Lincoln. I, I just, oh, man. Yeah, I think that's. He couldn't the even one. get to week one. Uh, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, I, I, you just, oh man, he's, he's taken a beating on social media. I mean, I, <laughs> the one where he has a losing record on two continents now. I, that's, 
Yeah, that's one I saw. And someone told me yesterday, I think it was our friend Josh Calloway said that if he won 50 consecutive games from this point on, that he'd catch Bo Pelini's overall record at Nebraska's winning. He'd have to go 50 but he has to win 50 in a row. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that's, and you, you know, as an as a Nebraska fan, I, it's hard to believe where that program has been. I think that was, uh, that was, that's tough to see and tough to digest. I know Oklahoma fans had a tough run in the nineties, but just imagine being a Nebraska fan right now. Goodness. Well, Nebraska before OU heads there in week three, they've got North Dakota and Georgia Southern. We'll see where they are by then. They should be two and one. I the Georgia Southern one could just get – I don't Well, I don't think they can go that far off the rails. But at this point, no. I mean, shoot, I, I saw something. I think they're, they were at an 88% win probability when Scott Frost decided for that, for that onside kick. Yeah. So they could be up 20 on Georgia Southern, and I don't think anybody in Lincoln's feeling comfortable yet. So we'll see where they are in week three. But, Eric, it's week one. We got football on Saturday. We're going to be there. We got a lot coming out b- between now and then. Yeah, and they're, they're, you know, like uh, you're going to do a – a huge Brent Venables piece. I know you've talked to a lot of people for that story. I'm really looking forward to reading it. You got to talk to Dabo Sweeney, which was great. Get a one-on-one with him. You've talked to Brent and you've talked to a lot of other players and elements. I'm looking forward to that story. That's going to hit uh, tomorrow. Is that right? Tomorrow you know? morning. Fire up. Which, which is Thursday. will be there. Yeah. So that's and, correct. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, we'll have all our game coverage. Me, Eli, Garen Emig, and uh, Ian Mall, our great photographer. We don't talk about Ian enough. Uh, Ian Maud does great work. He's going to be in Norman with us on Saturday. It's, it's football season. So I guess next week we'll be talking about the results of UTEP and looking forward to Kent State. So I'd like to thank everyone for uh, taking time to listen to our podcast. Uh, you, you can read all our content on TulsaWorld.com. And just, rem- uh, just a reminder that you can download this episode for free on Apple, Google, or Spotify, just wherever, whatever platform you use. And uh, Eli, here we go. Let's have some fun. Here we go.